Greetings and welcome to a video that nobody asked for, but somebody might find it useful in the future. What I'm doing in this video is I'm going to show you a full production Vault Professional system, which is fully automated, very bespoke. The whole point of this, mate, is to show either yourself or if you need to show your gaffer a full a kind of an in-place reference site for Vault Professional if you're thinking about getting it and you're not sure about what it can do and what the capabilities of it are. Once you get it customized to your liking, that's kind of the point of this. What I can't do is explain why certain things are set up the way they are. I can't explain how they're set up. I can't show the back end. I can only show limited amounts of things due to time and IP reasons. And if there's anyone very experienced with Vault watching this, there will be certain things that you'll see within this environment that you'll go, that is very odd. Why have you done that? The, trust me, the, there is very valid reasons as to why we set this up the way we set it up. And a lot of them date back years. Things have changed since then, and it just is how it is. But um, yeah, that's that's uh, something I just need to get out of the way before I get cracking with this. Now, this happens to be my vault environment this is the one that both myself and a very highly skilled team of people have spent many many years setting up uh, it's something that i manage day in and day out and it is a it's an engineering company in england roughly 150 staff or 150 engineers shall we say checking and checking out this vault every day uh, we've got a, a site over in china and we have a, a site up the road where we've got vault replication going on but uh, I'm not going to show sort of the server back end of things. You don't really need to see that. But it is a very heavily used system with a lot of traffic that goes through it. And there's a lot of people checking in and checking out of this. So I'll show you the mechanics of the vault system, how it all comes together, and uh, some things in terms of configurables. This is far from standard. A lot of what you're about to see is customized beyond what vault will actually let you customize. So this is where we've sourced in third party help to, uh, to, to, to write us programs to, to get stuff done. So it starts at the CAD side and the CAD applications. Now we use Autodesk Inventor and AutoCAD. Uh, not so much AutoCAD anymore, mostly Autodesk Inventor. And uh, our customization begins when users... Oh, I want you to fix that. Style library conflict. Uh, it starts when users hit save. So we've got a part numbering system whereby the users can select a drop-down list here and they can pick whatever the file is that they're designing. They can pick a part number and the system will generate a part number for them whether it be a standard company part number or if it's a design a file that's not going to be in the bill of materials. It can be a non-bill of material part. It can be a phantom part. And then it'll generate a number based off of what it is that they're doing. It just makes sure that all the files that go into our vault follow a strict naming convention. And we've been very, very, very strict with that. If you go to any folder in our vault, I can pick any folder at random and it's broken down into part numbers and part number folders. So... Our part numbers are AA, AB, AC, A1234, 1235, 1236, so on and so on. And every single part number goes into a folder named after the part number. So I can guarantee you that if I click this one at random, there'll be a file in here called AJ3009. It is that strict. If anything goes into the vault in the wrong folder, it's immediately rectified. So this is something that we keep on top of very, very strictly. So that all starts at the beginning. Uh, we can skip this though if you're just doing a test part or if I'm just doing something for a training environment then I can drop it into here and I can call this I don't know just test part or whatever and then this is our first proper bit of customization now we sourced in uh, a third party developer to write us this program and this allows us to ensure that the users always put a description into the right properties because our parts once they go into vault they then get assigned to an, a vault item, which I'll show you what that is later on if you don't know what that is. And the item reads the description from the inventor file. And it's really, really important that the item receives that description because the item then gets sent to an ERP system all automatically. So the description needs to start here. So we give all the users like a prefix as to what it is. What are you designing? Is it a thimble? Is it a tie rod? Is it a, a tire? Is it a socket, bracket, plate, fabrication, assembly? What is it, mate? And they can then pick that here and then type in whatever free text afterwards you know something like that and then the press return and by the way this is not skippable they can't escape out of this this has to be typed into the press return and then that puts it into the eye properties and then we can check that and just you can see verification there that has gone into there now we've got all kinds of other checks and validations going on via that bit of automation We've got part number checking, so if there's a part number which is AB12345, it'll 
flag that up so it shouldn't have five characters at the end of our part numbers it should be a b one two three four so we've got all kinds of checks in for that if uh, if somebody makes a, an assembly saves that assembly and then calls this a fabrication which means it's something that we buy in our automation automatically sets the uh, bit of materials to purchase so when it does go into vault and it does get assigned an item, all the children are ignored and it becomes a single line item in the bill of materials. So we've got all kinds of automation, There's tons more, but that's where it all starts. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, just a brief overview of some of the kinds of automation that you can put into uh, the CAD side of things. Once the designs are all done, they're all checked into vault. We've got full revision control workflows and uh, approval processes in place inside a vault. So this assembly and drawing set here, it's all a pre, it's work in progress. We call it preliminary work in progress. I, I don't know where the preliminary came from. It's a legacy thing. But it's essentially work in progress. It's a revision zero. And we've got this set up so that only, only line items receive a revision number. So all of these parts here, dash 001, 002, 003, these are all non-bill of material parts. They're plates and bits and pieces that we've made to make a single line item. These need to exist in geometry, but we're not gonna buy them. We buy, uh, well, not that either, because that's ended up being a fabrication as well. We need to buy, say, for example, this here, that welded, weld assembly of a swing frame. We put that into a bill of materials, and then that's what gets bought. All of the bits that make up this don't care about them. Don't care about them at all. So what we then do inside a vault is uh, we, we again, this all happens automatically. As soon as the files hit vault, they get assigned a category. And our categories are broken down into things like engineering drawings, which is a blue square, engineering models, which is a yellow square. And then we've got non-bomb parts, which are the black ones. These blue ones here are design substitutes, things like shrink wrap, derived parts. There's a whole bunch of other categories and a whole bunch of rules that <laughs> dictate how it all comes together. And uh, this, I, I, wrote, I wrote every single one of these, and it, it took a long time. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of rules. So things like FEA files. So if a file extension hits the vault and its file extension is FWIS, then it goes under the Inventor Simulation Files category, and then it's not given a revision number because it's just a simulation file. And then the same goes for a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, just look at our non-bomb. Look at these rules. As long as the file name doesn't contain all of this, then put it on. <laughs> it's crackers, man. But that's how customized it ended up being. In terms of categories, uh, these are the categories that we've got. Uh, sales documentation, supporting documentation, visualization, library parts. And a file can be put on any one of these categories based off of the rules that you've just seen. And then the category then assigns the file the life cycle. And the life cycle is that. Work in progress, released, obsolete, locked, unlocked. Based off of what category the file goes on to, it will get a different life cycle. So anything that's like standard design, bill of material, bought and made parts, they all get put onto the normal life cycles like WIP. They go through a full check-in process. But anything that's just sales documentation, it doesn't need to go through approval processes. Well, then that might go onto a life cycle that's just locked and unlocked. Library parts, for example, nuts and bolts. You, obviously, nobody checks bolts. You buy them in. They're just off-the-shelf parts, so they don't need to go through an approval process so they just get locked and unlocked. So we've got all of that in the background as well. And uh, once all that's been said and done, we assign the uh, the parts to an ECO. So an ECO is an engineering change order. It's Vault's way of documenting change. Change orders can be raised for uh, first release or they can be raised when something that's previously been signed off and built is receiving a revision. You need to document the reason for that change. So what we do is we go to the uh, the design and then we right click on it, add it to a change order and then to a new one. And this is Vault's engineering change order process. But basically there's no flexibility with this change order process. It doesn't matter how big your company is, you work with the same form. But smaller teams may not require uh, to to f make this as complicated as ours is, for example. So on our first page, we've got a whole bunch of custom properties at the bottom, which the engineers need to fill in to instruct downstream people why this thing's changing. So what what is the reason for the change? Is it a design necessity? Is it a cost improvement? Uh, what's the impact of the change? Is it high, low? You know, what, what do you want to do with the stock? Is there any purchasing action required downstream? A whole bunch of properties need to be typed in here. So then that becomes visible to people 
later on once all the designs been signed off so uh, because this is just a test i can just say test but it, this would typically be in this change order title this would be something like a, a brief explanation of what's happening plate being shifted three mil and then in the detailed description you can type in a lot more information you can copy and paste the notes into here it's just the whole point of this is to it's to pass audits really is to make sure you you pass an audit it's really helpful when in three years time something goes wrong and then somebody who didn't even work at the company at the time needs to find out why something happened three years ago and then you can look back to this document and you can see and read these notes and figure out why somebody did something because it might not seem obvious at the time so you would include loads of info here or as much as you can and then uh, you'd go to the routing list right the routing list is really 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 important this assigns the change to a team so like i said in smaller companies you wouldn't have teams but in bigger companies you could end up with multiple departments so we've got a department called tmr department called services ras each one of these has a different set of people who would act on the change who could be involved in the change so people in this team don't really care what's going on in this team, for example. So you'd assign it to a team. I'm just going to leave it as default. Uh, in fact, I'm going to leave it as that one there because I'm in here. I uh, would leave it in this uh, this root list and then you just hit save. And then we can move this through to the next state. So the change itself has its own little approval process, its own little life cycle. So at the moment, the change document is being created. What we then do is we submit the change for it to be open. So an engineer would do that. And then because this is just a first release, we don't have to approve the change because nothing's changing. It's a first release. So you would probably just fast track that through in force approval. Uh, but if it's being up issued, uh, you'd have different people involved in the process at different points. So for example, if this was an up issue, we would have an engineer create the change. So this is almost like the engineer saying, I suggest that we make a change and I'm going to move it to open. Then what happens is a senior team principal or somebody with you know approval rights, an experienced engineer would take a look at the document and go, right, yes, I agree that, uh, yeah, that is what I asked you to do. Or yes, I agree that needs to be done. And then that person is the one with the rights to move the change to be worked on. The, the engineer who raised the change would only be able to move it to here, and then that team leader can move it to here. And what we've got in our vault, again, I can't speak for anybody else. This is just how I've set our system up. Our system, when you move the change order from here to here, that's when the files can be unlocked. If the senior experienced engineer doesn't move the change to here, the files can't be unlocked because the change needs approved. It's all, again, part of passing an audit. If someone was to say, why did a part get up issued? Why was it changed? Why was it allowed to be changed? We can say, well, it couldn't have happened unless somebody with the authority to approved and authorized that change. And that happens by moving the change order to the work state that allows the files to be unlocked. And then what happens is the engineers do the work. They submit this change order into the review state. And then the senior and the experienced engineer looks at the drawings and then goes, yep, everything's good. He moves the change order into the closed state. And then only when the change order is closed, that's when the files can be released. So this process here is linked into our lifecycle process very closely. And it works really well, actually. It, it's, uh, it, seems to, it seems to do the job. I would, I would prefer a bit more flexibility with it, but it is what it is. And then that's, uh, that's where we're at with that. Okay, right, now that that's done, uh, I can uh, close the change order off. Well, actually, I'll not do it yet because uh, we haven't moved the files out of work in progress yet, but that will be the next stage. So this is the first release. We use file life cycles, as I've explained before, so everything's work in progress. And the way we, this is the way everyone does it, but this is uh, our states, is we'd select a, a drawing or would select an assembly, hit change state, and it'll bring up a list of all the files which are underneath that drawn. So you can show it in different views like that, and then you can just see where everything is. So this drone uses these two parts and uses that assembly, and this assembly's got all these children, these children using that drone. And you can just apply a state to the to the entire lot. So you can just sorry, move everything into checked. So our, this entire model and data set has been checked now. It's been checked by a, an experienced engineer, and then that's now applied against the files. And this is now documented in the history of all of these files it will be documented that today which is the 29th of june at 10 to 3 
all of these files moved into the checked state and it was done by me at this time so that's that's good it's good for history uh, and that's now stamped there forever and now that it's checked uh, we can go to the change order so you can just you can either go to the master change order list which i'm not going to click because it'll you'll see all the change orders of a live company but the change order list shows a list of every single change order which essentially they all look like that you can see the description, the state of the change order, the number. You'll just see a massive list of those for live changes that are in action on our projects. Uh, but then you can just go to the change order and say, right, everything's great. This thing that's never been made before because it's revision zero. I'm happy with it. I'm going to close the change order. The fact that this is a generated new part has been documented. And then we can go to the drawing or the assembly. Whichever you actually, I forgot, I've completely forgot a, uh, a stage here. After the uh, the change order has been closed, I oh, can do this before the change order has been closed. We need to link our CAD files to items. Now, items aren't essential in a Vault Professional system. Again, I cannot possibly begin to go into the details of why we have the system set up the way we do. This is certainly not normal, and anybody who's experienced at Vault will be able to note that and will point it out. It works though, and there's a reason why this is the way it is. But we assign our assemblies and our parts to an item the item master is a huge part catalog for every product our company has ever done and if you think to yourself well isn't that what the isn't that what the files are no the way we have our system set up is our files are the they're, they're just the details they're the, the the representations pictorial representations of what the products are we then generate part records f off of our files. So every single assembly that's ever been done in our company has a, a corresponding item for it. And each one of these items, if we just open them up, is like it's, it is a digital record that represents what that product is. So this part number here is uh, a spares kit. And then here's some properties here unique to that kit. These are properties that you wouldn't otherwise be able to put into a file, or if they are into a file, you'd need the CAD application to see these properties, which isn't much good to people that need to see the properties that don't have the CAD programs. These items are accessible and easily viewable by people who aren't in the engineering world. They don't have CAD, they don't know how to use CAD, but they need to look up parts, for example. So we generate these items off of our CAD files, and we've got uh, a system in place so that everything works as smooth as it could possibly be. All we do is we right click on our main GA assembly, our main top level assembly, and we say assign an item to that assembly. And what Vault then does is it looks at the structure of the card assembly. It looks at all the children and it decides what needs to be in the bill of materials. And in this case, nothing, because it's a fabrication. This is something that we don't, remember all these parts here, 381 these are non bill of material parts so these should not be listed as line items in a bill of materials if they weren't if these were all parts that we need to also separately buy in they would all be listed underneath here in a tree structure bill of materials which will be identical to the structured bill of materials tab in Autodesk Inventor so once that item's been generated, it's not finished yet. We have to go and configure some properties. So does it have a documentation drawing? Uh, it does this part require an export license? And then this is a property for our ERP system. So downstream people can see where it's assigned in terms of costings and time, uh, not time codes and uh, purchasing codes, that kind of thing. And then, uh, then we hit save and that items at work in progress. And we've got another mechanism in place that whenever our files are sent into the released state, the item is then automatically moved into the release state. Vault cannot do that out of the box. That's custom functionality that we have in the background. Right, so now that that's done, we can now release our file. That seems like an awful lot of work, but it's because I'm talking and doing it at the same time. In reality, this is pretty fluent. It just, it just works, it just happens. You just move the file into release, it just does it. We can jump to the item, by the way, just before I release this, so you can see what happens, and you can see the change. I can right click on that assembly, and I can say, open the item, and it'll show you that item just before you release it, and make sure that everything's linked up, make sure your bill of materials is all good. And then uh, you can see it also links the drawing onto the item as well, so anyone who isn't in engineering can look at the item and go, ah, all right, I can just quickly look at that drawing. Uh, okay, the next stage is to move the drawing or the assembly of the top level into the released state. Now, this is when a whole load of automation 
happens then like it's like one big chain reaction we have so many processes in the background that happens and start whirring away the second that i move all of these files to the released state i'll explain what they are before i do it because they'll finish uh, before I, f I finish explaining them as soon as i click ok what will happen is that a job will be sent to like an ai bot that we've got running in the background on a different computer it's like a separate dedicated workstation and it's called the job processor that job processor will receive a job for each one of these drawings to make a pdf of every single one of these right every single one of these drawings will be converted into a pdf the automation will make the pdf and it'll then put that into this folder here and then link it underneath this tab here so anybody in the future will see released they'll be able to click the drawing go to the secondary document tab and they'll be able to see the pdf of the released drawing that's one thing that happens the next thing that happens is it will go through and it will look at every single assembly and part and it'll go right are there any items assigned to any of these parts and assemblies if there are it'll move the item to the released state and it'll also check that the revision level of the item is at the same level as the file then what it does then what it does is after it's made the pdf put the item into the released state the next job that's fired is an export of an xml of the item it'll look at the bill of materials of the item and then export that to an xml document it'll then go into our folder here grab the pdf of the corresponding item or the, the drawing that's linked with the corresponding item and it'll then push them out of our vault into a watch folder on a server and then that watch folder is monitored by our erp system and the erp system pulls the data in so all the user does is none of that all the user does is just click okay and now what happens if we go to the job queue once it goes through there's quite a few files here to release it'll take a couple of seconds to shift all these into the released state there they go okay so now that that's done that there is a whole bunch of jobs triggered it's going to go through and create secondary documents for anything that's eligible to have one all of these ones here these are all just don't even dummy jobs they're just void these will just skip but anything that's an idw secondary documents idw it'll make a pdf for all of these and it'll just progressively go through them all and this is it here in action this is our job processor going through all of my nc parts checking to see if they have an item checking to see if they need a, a pdf made and then once it's done all of that it'll go ahead and export the data out of our vault into a folder and i'll show you where that folder is as well the folder is it's actually on what we call our k drive in this little hidden folder here and it'll put all the pdfs into here and all the xml documents will go into here and this folder is monitored by our erp system the erp system within a matter of seconds will grab the xml and the pdf and just push it out of this folder it'll just appear here for a split second and then vanish off into the erp world so uh, i'll give it a couple of seconds to let it process these jobs it it does take a, a couple of a couple of minutes to get through them especially if it's a big assembly but not so much to the point which it causes a bottleneck and as you can see uh now that all the jobs have finished processing just go to the job queue and just do a quick refresh and see they've all finished don't worry about these ones a long story uh all the xml's that have been processed these are a couple of live xml's here and there's my test one that has been generated by the job processor it's been exported into this watch folder and then the erp system will uh, will take it away and i've just paused that process because obviously i don't want test parts being sucked into the erp system but um these two applications that we've got running here called xml checker and draw copy i've just stopped those for the time being but these are the two utilities that send them off into the erp system and they do a quick check whilst they're doing that so the xml checker for example will scan through the xml file to make sure that there's no illegal characters inside the xml file make sure there's no parts inside there that shouldn't be there no missing descriptions that kind of thing and uh, once it's done the check it'll send them all off to the erp system and then it'll vanish from this folder and then the same goes for the pdf which you can see is there so because these are just test files i need to delete them because i don't want them being sent off into the erp system but now that they're good and the folder is good i can start cutting and start copying and then same with the draw copy start cutting and start copying and then within a matter of moments these two files should disappear off into erp world they'll be embedded into the erp system which is ifs that's the one that we use 
and then that's the end of the process of the release I guess release management of the workflow process uh, inside of vault I'll just wait for that to kick up it just has to fire up it runs on like a tick cycle uh, we'll go inside a vault and then we'll just take a look at what's been generated so everything's now released all the user did don't forget was just hit release and then that was it but you can see here we've got a PDF generated and then anybody who's got a vault client can click our drawings go to the secondary documents tab right click on that and then just open up the PDF and then this was automatically generated and then that's all good that's what's now sent to our ERP system and is also viewable inside the ERP system the item for the assembly if we right click on that and then say open the item the item is also now in a released state that's locked and sent off as lo along with its XML data into the ERP system and then the process continues and then the next thing you would do from here on if there was an up issue required is you would go to the assembly and then you would add that to a new change order this would then be an up issue a user would then change state, select work in progress once the change order has been raised. Again, we've got blocks and uh, mechanisms in place that prevent people from making an up issue unless a change order has been created and then approved. So if I was to try and put this into work in progress, it'll say, nope, you can't do that because a change order needs to be raised against it. And that change order needs to be approved by, again, that experienced engineer again. So all of these mechanisms are in place. To, uh, to make sure that nobody can do things that they're not supposed to do. And uh, all the user has to do is just hit change state, move the file in the next state, and then we've got all of that automation in the background just running processes and creating PDFs and sending data off to the ERP system. All of our users are separated into groups, which is something that is obviously highly recommended when it gets to a point where you've got quite a few users and uh, different levels of, I guess, hierarchy in the, in the tree structure. So we've got various groups inside the vault. We've got uh, approvers. So anybody who is able to move the files to you know, the released state and approve a change, they'll get put into the approvers group. And then I guess standard standard users, you know, draftsmen, uh, beginner, starter engineers, that kind of thing, they, those guys will be put into just standard users. Uh, we've also got a super users group for people who have got the ability to do a quick change, for example, if you're thinking, the bloody hell's a quick change, Neil. A quick change is, say for example, I've just released this. The PDF's just been made, but I've made a spelling error on the drawing. What we would do, rather than up issue it, you wouldn't want to up issue a drawing just for a spelling error, uh, providing that it's very soon afterwards. So this is a, a human call, is you would go to change state and then you'd move the drawing or the assembly into the quick change state. And that will allow you to edit the released file and then recreate the PDF and uh, recreate the bomb if, re if necessary uh, while staying at the same revision. That would be a quick change. As an extra point on quick change, in uh, most companies, it's recommended that you reserve the right to put something into quick change to uh, team leaders or someone in a senior position like engineering managers, else you'll get people abusing the quick change state after something's been released, especially with an automated system. It tends to have vanished off into the ERP system, the PDFs be made, the drawing could be in circulation. You don't want users abusing the quick change state and ending up with multiple created drawings at the same revision or multiple generated bombs at the same revision. So the quick change is something that's left at a, uh, a senior person's discretion, else uh, it'll be abused. And if you do give it to somebody who is on the engineering team, you can end up with clicks developing where people's, you know, mates, it's like, you know, mate, oh, can, mate can, you just, can you just drop this into quick change for us, please? Uh, you know, just do us a favor. Can you just drop this in a quick change? I've made an error, and I don't want—I don't want to up issue it because it'll make us look stupid. So uh, it's something that needs to be handled very carefully. In my company, we reserve this for the administration team only, and one or two very, very key experienced users, and that's pretty much it. So yeah, that's probably it. That's went on for quite some time. I may have lost quite a few people quite some time ago, but. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there, it's quite a complex system. This system has been nearly, what, six, seven years in the making. It, it took us roughly 18 months to get it off the ground to a point where we could sort of press the go button and make it live. And that was four or five years ago. And then since then, it's sort of evolved. And it's, uh, it's I guess it's not really important, but this is all going to change very soon as we bring our Chinese office online. Uh, the Chinese office aren't allowed to see the majority of data in our vault. So all our categories are going to change from being engineering drawings and engineering models to restricted models and global models and restricted 
drawings and global drawings and uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the data is going to be hidden from the Chinese vault. So uh, yeah, that's it. That I no idea if that's going to be useful to anyone. I appreciate it's not. It wasn't structured. It wasn't scripted. It was all over the place. But hopefully, if nothing else, it's useful for someone to see this, to so you can see what is possible from a highly customized vault professional system. There will be more heavily customized systems out there, but this is a real live environment that you're looking at. People are working on this right now as I speak, following the exact same processes that I've just been through, and it works, and it works very, very well. We are unfortunately at a point, and there's no getting away from this Autodesk. I don't know if they would disagree, but it's a fact. If you have a system of this size, we have 150 engineers logging in, logging out. We've got so much automation that things can go wrong. For example, in the job queue, you can see here, there's an export error. Our program, which exports the XMLs, failed to export this XML because of all of this. It is a full-time job for either myself or an administrator to constantly monitor and fix errors with, uh, with the workflows at multiple different points whether it is an export, whether it's a PDF not creating, whether a, a bill of materials from a CAD file didn't generate properly into an item, whether a file won't change state properly. When you've got this many users and this kind of a system, it is a full-time job for somebody to constantly monitor and correct errors. You cannot get away from it. So just be just be aware of that. If that's you, if you're an engineer or if you're an engineering manager and you're thinking of putting a system like this in, just be aware, you will have to employ somebody if you've got this level of, of of customization with this volume of traffic going through it. Anything less than maybe 10 users, 20 users perhaps, I don't know, I can't, it's impossible to put a number on it, but there, there will be a point where you don't have to have somebody dedicated to, to administering it, but there will come a point where it, the administration does take over. Uh, it's just a fact of automation. Automation is great, but it does go wrong and it does need human intervention. And like I said, at this level, it needs quite a lot. So uh, I'm going to knock it on the head there. I think that's probably enough. There is a ton more of stuff in here, obviously, that I haven't covered. We've got all kinds of uh, of right-click, send, you know, change documents and export. We can do whip pushes. So if a document is in work in progress, for example, and we want to, you know, it's a long lead item and it needs to go off into the ERP system sooner than it's, uh, than it, you know, before it's released, we can do a, a manual push off into the ERP system. We've got manual pdf triggers that we can do we've got all kinds of stuff that we can uh, we can do and it, a lot of our automation is done I just want to give a shout out to the company called cadac in holland those guys although they're not really our reseller they're not our cad supplier because we're in the uk these guys are in holland they supplied the majority of the automation that we've got here and i cannot speak highly enough of cadac if you want to see or investigate having this kind of a system in then take a look at their organist tools. This is an off-the-shelf utility that we found roughly six or seven years ago. At the time, it was in its infancy, I think that's fair to say, and we spent a lot of time working alongside Kadak to develop it. Along, you know, They've got a lot of other customers that would have done the same thing, but we helped shape that into what it is today, and it works extraordinarily well. And uh, those guys are just everything you want out of a CAD supplier when it comes to responses, when it comes to support, these guys are phenomenal. So Kadak Organis is our main tool that does a lot of the automation, the PDF creation, the synchronization between files and items, and uh, they create a lot of our other automation as well. Okay, guys, that'll do. This has probably gone on for way longer than half an hour now. If you've stuck through and watched the Vault video for longer than half an hour, I commend you. <laughs> because I, I, I haven't been funny here, I haven't been witty, I haven't been entertaining. This is pretty dry stuff, I, I know that, it's vault, it's not exciting, but hopefully it was useful, if anything else. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next video. Toodles!